There were a lot of questions on which the Buddha remained silent. Issues that were live issues back in his time, and many of them are still live issues now, that he refused to answer one way or the other. For instance, is human nature basically good or is it basically bad? He refused to answer. If there was anything innate in human beings, it was just one thing, the desire for happiness. That assumption is something that underlies all of his teachings, all of his techniques for training the mind. If we didn't desire happiness, there wouldn't be any purpose in being here. It's this desire that got us born in the first place and keeps us alive. And it's also this desire that helps us make sense out of the path. Why are you sitting here with your eyes closed? Why well, you want happiness? Is that desire a good thing or a bad thing? It depends on how you direct it. And the whole point of the Buddhist teachings is to direct it in the right way, so that you do attain a true happiness that doesn't cause any harm to anyone else. We've come here because we realize that ordinary happiness based on material things isn't enough. As the Buddha said, even if it rained gold coins, we still wouldn't have enough for our material desires. So desires for happiness that are pointed in that direction are pointed in the wrong way. We need a certain amount of material support to keep the body going, food, clothing, shelter, medicine. But when you reflect on these things, you realize you don't need all that much. Time spent on training the mind is much better spent. So that's what we're doing here, training the mind in terms of mindfulness, alertness. I'm trying to understand this intention that underlies that directs our desire for happiness. That's what we're watching as we sit here. We're meditating on the breath, but the purpose of the breath is to get the mind to settle down so you can really look at this intention that's keeping you with the breath. It's the best way to study intention is to intend one thing for long periods of time. So you can see how the mind fights among its intentions. You're sitting here for a little bit and the desire for something else comes up. And you've got to learn how to step in, decide which intention you're going to follow. And for the most part, our most part, our old habits send off, send us off in other directions. Saying, "Who wants to sit here focusing on the breath when your legs hurt and the breath isn't all that interesting?" Lots of more interesting things to think about. That's old habit speaking. So you've got to develop new habits. Just remind yourself, this is one area that you haven't really explored yet. What is it like to stay with the breath for long periods of time? And so do your best to argue with the mind, cajole the mind, anything that works to keep the mind with the breath. Explore how to make the breath comfortable. Look at the breath energy in the different parts of the body you don't normally look at. The breath in your shins, for example. The breath in your shoulders. The breath at the back of your skull. So shake up the mind a little bit. Loosen up its preconceived notions. If you can't loosen up its preconceived notions, you'll never see anything new. learn to reflect on what works and what doesn't work. It 
this is how we begin to take that desire for happiness and point it in the right direction. We often think of the desire for happiness as something selfish and narrow. But the Buddha pointed out that we can pursue it in a way that actually develops qualities that are noble in the mind. Purity, compassion, discernment. As the Buddha said, the beginning of discernment is the question, what when I do it will be for my long-term welfare and happiness. In other words, discernment is based on two things. One is the realization that there are short-term forms of happiness and long-term forms of happiness. And the long-term ones, even if they take more effort, are the ones that are really worth it. The second realization is just that. These things are going to require effort. You have to do things in order to attain happiness. So that's the beginning of discernment. You realize you have a limited amount of energy, a limited amount of time, and you want to get the best results on it. It sounds calculating, and it is, but it's calculating in the right direction. We somehow think that the calculating mind is a bad thing. Well, that's because it usually calculates in the wrong direction. Its calculations are lies, this self-deceiving. And here what you want to do is take that part of the mind that calculates and says, well, what's worth it, what's not worth it? And train it so that it really does help, it really does lead to a long-term happiness. So that's discernment. As for purity. The Buddha said you develop purity by reflecting on your actions, your intentions. Before you do something, where do you think it's going to lead? Before you say something, before you think seriously about something, where do you think these words, where do you think these thoughts are going to lead? If you see that they're going to lead to affliction for yourself or for others, don't do it. While you're doing the action, if it turns out it, you don't think it's going to cause any affliction, you go ahead and you do it. But while you're doing it, if it turns out that it is causing unexpected affliction for yourself or others, you stop. If you don't see any affliction while you're doing it, just keep on with it until you end. And then after it's done, you have to reflect. If some results come up later that you hadn't expected, okay, resolve never to repeat that mistake. Go and talk it over with someone else who's practicing. get their perspective on it. And then, as the Buddha said, resolve on restraint in the future. In other words, be honest enough to admit your mistakes. Have that amount of integrity. And compassion enough not to want to make the mistake again. You notice that the Buddha said, affliction for yourself or for others. You've got to take other people's feelings, other people's happiness into consideration. Why is that? If your happiness depends on their unhappiness, your happiness is not going to last. They're going to do what they can to overturn it. So you realize that if you want long-term happiness, you're going to have to think about other people as well. Find a way of acting, acting and looking for happiness that doesn't harm anybody. And that way your quest for happiness doesn't create enemies. It's on solid ground. So these two qualities together, you've got the purity and the compassion. Again, in the beginning it may sound calculating, but it's learning how to use that calculating part of the mind, not denying it, not saying it's bad. Realizing that like des the desire for happiness itself. It's something that can be directed in the right direction. And where does it lead? It leads to meditation. It leads to trying to develop concentration and discernment. So you can begin to uproot even the 
the roots, the potential for any kind of unskillful action through either greed or aversion or delusion. And in this way you embody the qualities appropriate to the Buddha. After all, those three qualities, discernment, purity, and compassion, those are the three traditional virtues of the Buddha. And this is how the desire for, for happiness can be directed into something noble. You benefit, the people around you benefit as well. Don't think that this is a selfish goal. If you're able to uproot greed, other people around you are not going to suffer from your greed. And if you can uproot aversion and delusion, nobody's going to suffer from your aversion or delusion. That right there is a huge gift. So it's in this way that your desire for happiness can be turned into something that's wise, pure, and compassionate. As you're sitting here struggling with a breath, it may not seem that's, that's anywhere near, but at least you're on the road, you're headed in the right direction. And so keep that thought in mind, because it's what gives you energy. And John Sawat tells us when he went first, first went to stay with a John Munn. And he was embarrassed to admit, after a couple of years of meditation, that he'd sit down and all I could see was how distracted his mind was. And John Munn comforted him. He said, well, it's in the Satipatthana Sutta. Being aware of a distracted mind as a distracted mind, that's part of right mindfulness. At least you're aware. And then John Sawat took the advice well. On the one hand, he didn't say, well, gee, that's all I need to do is be aware of my distracted mind. It's a distracted mind. That's it. Well, that's, that's not it. But at least it's heading in the right direction. He realized that John Munn was trying to give him encouragement, which people on the path all deserve, is all deserve encouragement. And being aware of the distracted mind as a distracted mind is a step towards finding what it's like to have an undistracted mind. Or as the Buddha once said, even someone who realizes that he's foolish, that's the beginning of wisdom right there. He's at least wise to that extent. Most people are fools and they go through life <laughs> as fools, and yet think they're wise and clever. Those are the ones whose quest for happiness is going to take a long, long time before they find anything of value. But seeing your distracted mind as a distracted mind, okay, beginning to realize, oh, here's a problem. The problem is not out there, it's right here in the distraction. And that gives you something to work on. And it may seem like a small step, but remember, it's part of a larger step. You're taking your desire for happiness, which is, seems to be frustrated right now and thwarted right now. But at least you're focusing it on the real problem. And it's when you're focusing on the real problem, there's a hope for a solution. And this particular solution is, some, is what takes that desire for happiness and doesn't fritter it away in mindless entertainments or destructive behavior. It points it in the direction that it turns into something that's noble, wise and discerning, kind and compassionate, noble and pure. So remember that this is a path that's good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. It's good all the way through. And 
recognize for yourself. Remember that you're not you're not stuck with any particular innate nature. You're, if you find yourself thinking petty thoughts or unwise thoughts or selfish thoughts, that's not necessarily your nature. That's just the habits you've picked up from your past ways of looking for happiness. So you're not stuck there. On the other hand, when you're thinking nice, kind thoughts, that's not necessarily your nature either. So you can't be complacent. What's innate in you is the desire for happiness. What you want to do is make sure that desire keeps pointed in the right direction. Everything else follows from that. 